In today's Marketer's Report, Kate Cronin, Chief Brand Officer of Moderna, weighs in on the speed of audio production. In this day and age, and particularly at Moderna, where we have new information coming out on a regular basis, being able to feed that information to the audio format makes being nimble and pivoting easy, and that's what I really like about it. As the number one audio company, iHeartMedia gives marketers access to the audiences, influencers, insights, and data you need to grow. If you're a marketer, go to iHeartResults.com. Can you have too many houseplants? I don't think so. Get some leaf joy by Proven Winners Houseplants. They have varieties like you've never seen. Big, small, tall, colorful, even some that grow in just water. And the quality is unreal. There is a leaf joy by Proven Winners Houseplant for every room in your home. They even come with care instructions. Leaf joy by Proven Winners. Bring nature inside. Shop for them at the Home Depot or your favorite garden center. You're listening to 100 Words or Less with Ray Harkins. Hello, podcast humans. Welcome to yet another episode of the show where we discuss why punk, hardcore, indie rock, emo, metal is so important to us and the lifeblood that we all cling on to. Like if this DIY music scene was a tree, we're all branches hanging off of it, right? What a beautiful metaphor. <laughs> I am thrilled to bring you this discussion because he's been on my laundry list of people to come on the show, and we finally did it. This is Wes Isold from American Nightmare, Cold Cave, and uh, Some Girls. Let's not forget that. He is a person I've personally looked up to, his art and his creative path, because he definitely has uh, you know, gone to the beat of his own drummer and really shifted the way that a lot of people I know think about like punk and hardcore and like the style in which American Nightmare approached what they were doing. It definitely shifted a lot of people's perspectives, including my own. And so Wes was great. And we had a in-depth discussion about all things American Nightmare, all things Cold Cave, all things him as a human being, because that's why I do this podcast. You if you are a, a strong listener of this show, or even if you are a passive listener, <laughs> I request this free help for the show. First of all, you can always email me, 100wordspodcast at gmail.com. Love to have feedback and people just saying what's up. All that stuff is definitely appreciated. You can also leave a rating and review on the Apple Podcast page if you are listening to it on there, or even if you're not, it doesn't matter. You can just dip in and leave a review. You can leave a rating on Spotify, and all of those things help this show get discovered by the people who need to hear about it. And that is the best way that you can support this show because, you know, I don't ask for money. Don't do a Patreon. Don't do any of that stuff. So, um, yeah, it would be helpful if you did those things. I want to just dive into this conversation because, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things on my mind right now in regards to, I'm going through some shifts personally, as far as a, uh, you know, new jobs going to be starting and, um, going to be going out to the new England metal and hardcore festival to do a series of podcasts and then maybe a few live podcasts, all of that fun stuff, but, um, there's just a lot going on. So that is why I'm not going to pontificate about anything right here. And let's just discuss Wes as a human being. And interview form, I think. That's what we do, right? Yes. Anyways, here's Wes. I will talk to you after the conversation is over to let you know who's coming on next week, because that's what I always do in case you just basically bail right after the interview is done. Just stick around for their like minute, maybe two minutes, most. So here we go. Here's Wes. Existing on the West Coast, uh, you know, when American Nightmare first started to uh, pop off, I think you definitely captured a lot of people's uh, imaginations as far as like, oh, cool, like this is what hardcore can sound like now as opposed to, you know, just kind of rehashing the same stuff over and over. And when you guys first came over here, um, like I distinctly remember uh, a show that I watched you guys at uh, the Ohio Women's Center in Ohio. Yeah. And that was, uh, it just felt, so desperate for you guys playing because there was this uh 
I don't know, just this intensity where you guys were like, I don't even know if we're going to be a band. Like, and of course this is kind of, you know, sort of revisionist history. It, sure, yeah. like, but that uh, it, it seems like, and multiple times that I saw you play in that original iteration, it seemed like that almost every single show. I'm going to guess that obviously was, was kind of generically the feeling of like, Oh, this could be our last two or who knows. I think it was just so in the moment and never even thought about like the fact that I played shows a few days ago is insane to me. Um, I, I do think part of the impact that the band had was that sort of desperation and uh, in the moment spontaneity of not knowing when it would combust. I mean, I knew it eventually would at some point, but it really, it was a, it was a no past, no tomorrow sort of thing. Um, we're just doing it. And so much so that there was all these things that, I think you, you can only sort of exist in that type of band when you are in that mindset, like not considering anything else in the world. Like I never knowing where you were going to sleep or what you were getting paid or if you were getting paid or what you would eat or if you would eat things like that. Um, you can only do that if you literally don't care. And um, that was sort of the motif of the whole thing. Just didn't, <laughs> didn't care. And I think that transpired into our performances and yeah, what was attractive about the band. And I mean, going back to what you said about like the way it sounded or the way it was looked or the way it was presented, I think there was elements of um, different f facets of subgenre hardcore related like microcosms, but didn't really dedicate itself to just one of those sounds. Like, you know, it wasn't just like a fast, like straight edge band and definitely wasn't like a metal influenced band, but it was like, it had the ferocity of maybe like what harder sort of like metal tinge hardcore bands had. But I think the desperation of it made it like more violent in a way. So like people who liked sort of harder hardcore were a little confused by it at first, but it ended up ultimately kind of making sense to them. And then I think people who liked faster hardcore felt the same. Like it wasn't what they had previously been like listening to, but it was close enough and something new. And I don't know. I mean, I look, I loved coming to California those first few times. I felt like we were in like a new world and it was just fun to explore that world. Yeah. Oh, I, I agree. And honestly, like as a person, I mean, cause I, I'm 42 years old and like watching like, it takes every, you know, whatever, three to five years to watch a band, you know, kind of emerge that, you know, maybe either younger than you or the same age where it just kind of gives you that little shot in the arm. And I think to your point, exactly what you're talking about, where it's like, you know, you guys plus many of your peers kind of gave that push for people to think, you know, in a different way about like that, you know, survival mode of just like, oh yeah, like, you know, we're, we don't know if we're going to come through here again. And it always kind of felt like there were certain bands you knew you were going to be able to see again, but it always felt like with American nightmare. There's like, I don't know, man, this could be the last time they play out here. Who knows? <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. Like, like a few weeks ago, or maybe a couple months ago, our guitar player, Brian Masick, he sent me a photo of the Ohio women's club. And like in, in my like lifelong naivety, I thought he was, rom I knew he was in Ohio in in Ohio and I thought he was like romanticizing it and just sending me a picture of it. And I was like, Oh, that's so great. You went to look at it. And he's like, what? No, I was eating restaurant at a restaurant across the street and looked up and noticed it was right there. So, so, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. He wasn't like Google image searching where it's like, Hey Wes, remember this show? It's like, <laughs> yeah, Oh that's man. What, <laughs> that's what I thought. I mean, that's the head I'm living in, but you know. no, I love that. I love that. Well, we'll pull on some of those threads a little bit later, but, um, you know, reflecting on you as a person, I know that, you know, you've expressed this on many different interviews and podcasts and what have you in regards to, you know, your dad growing up the Navy and obviously being a Navy brat moving every so often because of the different assignments and everything like that. I, I'm going to kind of, I mean, I would say play armchair psychologist, but like some version of that where because of that, were you kind of forced to be introverted in a way because you just couldn't expand the energy of like, Yo, I got to make new friends now because we move every two years. Or absolutely, is, I mean, okay. I remember, I remember a distinct cutoff uh, in mood as a child, and it was uh, on the last day of 
I'm, not, I'm shedding no tears here. I just distinctly remember it. it was, it was the last day of fifth grade and it was the longest I had ever lived somewhere. It was like first through fifth grade. I was in Virginia beach and we literally moved on the last day of school. And that was kind of like the age when you start turning into like a, a human. Like I was listening to lots of music by then. And I had had friends for a few years and it was just like torn on that day. And I think ever since that day, um, it was I definitely had more of an inner dialogue than outward. And um, from, from that moment on, it was moving every year or every two years. And um, I, I relied heavily on music through that time. Just that, you know, that, that was sort of like my go-to um, way of coping. Sure. That was your companion. Cause that, I mean, clearly that can travel with you. Whereas like, you know, your best friends that you made for that year, like can't. <laughs> Yeah. And like now it's weird because, you know, I'll see people who I haven't seen, you know, and, and like how everyone does, you see people you haven't seen in years, but it feels like no time's passed because you're aware of like their life through different facets of, of, you know, communication. But, you know, back then it was just literally, you'll never see this person again. Right. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a very, yeah, it's a very distinct cutoff where it's just like, man, yeah, I often think where it's like, man, I would, I wonder what happened to my friend in fourth grade. It's like, well, no way to, I mean, maybe I can find him on Facebook or whatever, but yeah, it's very true. It's very distinct cutoff. Yeah. And at the same time, like sometimes they like appear now and I'm like, who, who are you? <laughs> you know, but like, but it seems so traumatic, man. <laughs> you <know? laughs> totally. You're like, wait, are we expected to just like step into, I guess, playing basketball now? Cause that's what we did in fourth grade or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Right. Um, and what was your, I mean, I, I know like your dad was in the Navy and did you have a, I guess, family structure at home? Like was mom in the house and do you have any brothers and sisters? I wasn't aware. I have a younger sister. She's three years uh, younger than me. Uh, my mo- my mother was in the house. Um, she had um, jobs here and there. Like some, she was a, an educator, and sometimes picked up teaching jobs depending on how long we were around somewhere. Right. But um, and, and, you know, on, on paper, it was pretty um pretty traditional. Sure. And what was the um the i guess your 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 favorite stop <laughs> as you were in your travels uh when when you were younger like that i mean it just sort of you know, anywhere that that we landed where there was um culture where where i thought i could get one step closer to what i loved which was like like music by way of like skateboarding or something so um you know for growing up at virginia beach was very cool like it was heavy surf and skate and bmx culture and um you know that's where you first saw like punks in the mall and stuff like that and then um you know i lived in in florida which was which was similar um uh, i lived in germany which which had great stuff going on and then you know between those moves i lived like on in literal cornfields in pennsylvania and in maine right. so you know, th- those times were, um, it's weird because those times were, I was certainly unimpressed and not into where I was, but I absorbed more in those places than anywhere else. So like, in a way, I'm really thankful for those years and more or less isolation. And, you know, the, the people I was friends with, I only knew for a year, maybe two years most, but I spent so much time absorbing music and, and, and books and records that, you know, I probably wouldn't be who I was today or I am today had I not been forced to, uh, you know, look at cornfields for years, you know? Sure. Absolutely. And I, I think, I mean, I'm sure I know you can probably experience this as well when you start to tour and you start to experience all of these different, you know, cities and suburbs that you're playing. Yes, it's exciting to play New York, LA, you know, Berlin, whatever, all these major, you know, markets, as they say in the business. But then, you know, when you have this random show in, you know, Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, where it's like, <laughs> you're like, what? wow, 200 people showed up to this and everyone was losing their minds because of, to your point, and, just that geographic isolation in some capacity. Yeah. And those are in a way the most special because I can relate to living in those towns and, 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 and awaiting some like hypothetical show that might, that might happen, you know? Right. And, <laughs> right. And, um, and when it does, it's, it's, it's just so glorious and special. And then, you know, when I lived in, um, this town called Topson, Maine, where I graduated high school, I was there for 11th and 12th grade. I was booking shows there and, um, 
you know, I, I, a few of them. And I, there was a club in New Hampshire I would do a couple at. And then there were some in like a neighbor's house that we did a couple in like his parents' attic and like just wondering if the bands would show up. But like it was, it made those show is even more special like you know you, you know the band's going to show up in new york or like the, the cities you mentioned but and at the same time you know when we were i think there was a shift in particular like, i think our world of hardcore like you didn't really play those cities that much it, no. it was a lot of suburban shows you know we, we weren't playing la all the time there, there was no la venue like the smell had just opened we we played there like once but like it, it was places like oh and bakersfield and stuff like that you know yeah oh absolutely because yeah those are it those you would have the more you know quote-unquote unconventional spaces where people would be throwing shows at a basement of a pizza place or whatever so yeah right like, like if i get that tour rowdy now i'd be like it's a wrap i'm done <laughs> you know <laughs> <It's> not, <laughs> yeah you're like I'm, gonna, I'm an adult i'm not i'm not playing this place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally totally yeah you're like someone didn't really think this out i totally get it. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, for, forgive the morbid curiosity, but like you, you actually correct me if I'm wrong. You were born without a hand, right? Like you did not lose that in some accident. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. And, uh, I, I'm going to guess that like you had to go through some sort of like, uh, occupational therapy or anything, how to, you know, kind of obviously handle life based around the fact that like, you know, clearly most people have two hands. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, I remember a few times, I think it was pretty haphazard. I didn't really, I don't, I don't think I was taken to too many, uh, like lessons or anything like that. Sure, I, think, sure. I think it was just like, here's a couple options. Um, you can explore them if you want. And then, uh, be, and I don't think that was done that much. I think it was, it was pretty much thrown to the wolves, like go figure it out, you know? And, um, sure. That's sort of been the way ever my whole life. Go figure it out. Right. And uh, yeah, because I, I think the, of that era, they're definitely, you know, it's like now if I mean, say, you know, your, uh, you know, your child was born without some sort of appendage, like you would have, you know, this occupate this like really thought out process of like occupational therapy, you know, definitely there's a there's a there's a support network for people now, you know, and I remember like, when, when I had it, that wasn't um, like when I got my, my first prosthesis or something that wasn't really I don't remember being surrounded by other children like that. Um, like right. occasionally, occasionally we go to the children's hospital uh, down the street from where we live in Los Angeles. And there is a very dedicated, beautiful group that um, is dedicated strictly to people with these sort of uh, cases similar to mine. And, you know, there's a whole network and the, you get to see other people and they, and they, they'll bring in people like me or, other older people who are doing things that they're into and they'll say, look, it's not like there, there are options. Like you're not totally fucked. So you can do this stuff. <laughs> totally. but, um, yeah. And and it's interesting too, because in my experience in showing up in these places, it's, it's more to sort of um, plead your existence to the parents, you know, like your child who was born this way will have a date one day. You know, it's not like, the world's not going to shun them totally. I like, don't fret too much. Right. But, um, you know, my parents were like, they were, um, their approach to it was like, they signed me up for everything. So like, okay, you're going to play baseball. You're going to play basketball. You're going to play. This. Like I played soccer a lot of my life, but they also signed me up for, um, sports that were like pretty challenging for me. And I, and I, did them. I mean, they didn't like, I didn't have a connection with them and didn't pursue them. Right. But, but I did successfully try them and competed and did things, you know, swimming, like everything. But, um, it didn't really matter because by the time I was doing stuff like that, I was already uh, in love with music. Right. <laughs> as, as the, uh, the age old story goes where it's just like, you know, you have that fork in the road moment of like, am I a sports kid or am I, you know, a punk and hardcore kid? Or yeah. It's like, I, I appreciate this, but deep in my heart, I'm a punk. You know? right. So so I gotta go. <laughs> right. And I, I do like, obviously how that has evolved to where it's like, you know, now like people can celebrate the fact that they, you know, whatever love Manchester city. And like, obviously, like our punk and hardcore kid where it's like you know there was an era where it's like dude don't talk too much about your love for baseball like 
<laughs> just pay attention. Yeah, absolutely. Or or other music, even you know it's, that it, it's very true. Where it's like, yeah, you're allowed to like you know this particular bucket of bands, and it's like, of course you can like Joy Division, but don't you dare go down that Bauhaus road. <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I remember like people, you know, when I was just, when I was getting into punk, like literally saying, don't tell people you like the Smiths. Like that was a real conversation that was had with me by an older person. Like who, who was like, yeah, like they are good, but don't, don't tell anyone, you know? Yeah. Don't, pu- don't publicly admit that you like NXS's kick. It's like, what, what are we, what are we talking about? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and so when you were, you know, kind of just, caring about school or like attending school? Like, did you, you know, I guess, were you academically inclined? Did you like that aspect of your life or was it pretty much just torture from, you know, elementary school onward? Um, I did not like it. I, I was pretty numb throughout the whole thing. And um, I, I just, I just, I was there, I, I was present, but I didn't, um, I was just in my own head and, and thinking about my own stuff and, um, pretty oblivious to anything that was going around me, everything that was going around me and just trying to survive and, um, you know, super self-conscious and just didn't want to rock the boat and just wanted to, um, keep absorbing what was speaking to me. And then, um, I got like very middle of the road grades. And then I had these weird situations where, um, I think I got like weird mercy, good scores in certain classes, just, just for existing and being there and not talking. You know, I always, I always got like, I always excelled in like English classes and was put in like AP classes for stuff like that. And I literally never did homework. I was buying records and listening to records. I could care less about this world. I was just sort of biding my time until I was set free. But, um, I think I had the mercy of a few, um, Teachers, teachers passing you through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who, who just like assumed I'd be okay in, in these subjects, you know? Right. Right. And it, I, it's funny you say that because I, I do think that many people, once you kind of learn how to play the, you know, air quotes here, the game in regards to not saying that you were, you know, angling for just, you know, passing by on like any charm or whatever, but just like when you learn how to be like, okay, this is the effort I put in. And then this is the grade that I get. And as long as you are maintaining that sort of level and understand that, like it really kind of unlocks that schooling component in most people's lives. Yeah, exactly. And, and then, you know, and then of, of course, like in retrospect, you could have done far less. And probably got better <laughs> grades, <you know? laughs> Totally. Where it's like, what, what is the minimum th- effort that I can put in, but then obviously still go, you know, skating and go to shows in the weekend with my friends or whatever. Exactly. I, I just could, I could have cared less, you know, I, 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 it was just not my, it was not my t- cup of tea. Yeah. And I, I'm guessing, was there any, uh, you know, hope that you were going to, you know, enlist in the Navy or, uh, you know, kind of follow along your father's footsteps or was that a pretty clear, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Um, that was never spoken about. I, 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 I think in part because I was born without a, a hand and sure. I think that that was not a thing that you could even do at the time. You know, I don't, I don't think they were enlisting like amputees into the military in, in like the late nineties. I don't, I really don't think that was a thing. You know, you weren't even allowed to have tattoos upon enlisting. Yeah. Until that's a good like, point. so I think, um, um, I think that coupled with my spirit was never a, a point of contention, you know, or, or, or a possibility. It was just, a, it was just non-existent. Yeah. Well, it didn't need to have a conversation. I mean, it's like the, you know, whatever in Vietnam, people with flat feet and it was like the same, <laughs> same idea where it's like, Hey guys, I, I literally don't have a hand. I cannot do whatever it is that you're potentially going to ask me to do. Yeah. It's like, I'll shoot this gun. I'll probably miss that. You know? <laughs> right. I can't, <laughs> yeah. I can't say I'll be horribly accurate. But I think like, you know, in like, I, I it, also in, in retrospect, I think I was, I was holding on to, um, this secret that I knew that I was going to have a life in music. And it was not something that I ever voiced or expressed interest in, uh, aside from being obsessed with it. And I certainly was not encouraged to pursue that world by family or, or anyone in, in, that I had ever met in my life. It was just a personal thing that I had. 
And so I had to sort of just sit quietly and wait for this moment to arrive, to arise where I was able to pursue it. And I think when you manifest um, such a love for something, you sort of make yourself available to people who come into your life and sort of provide channels for you to slip, slip down. And that's what I did. So I had to, I had to suffer through school. I had to let my parents sort of search for a path for me that I knew I wasn't going to take, you know, they were like, here's a school here. Here's a school here. Like, you know, post high school, like you could go, you could go this route, you could do this thing. And I was just kind of shrugging like, "Eh, I don't know. I don't think so without ever saying what my plan was, because certainly a plan at that point that is not that attractive to a parental figure is I'm going to be in a, in a hardcore band. And I know that that's going to provide a life for me. And, um, but I did have a sinking, uh, intuitive feeling that that was the path I was going to take and it would, and and I would be fine. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't know why it has been, but it's probably because I just knew it would be as there was nothing else I was interested in or, or cared about at all. And, And my, my obsession and love for, for music and for, for punk and hardcore and, and, and sort of outsider counterculture world was really so obsessive that there was just no other option. Rockabilia.com is the place where you can find Depeche Mode shirts. You can find Iron Maiden shirts, Black Sabbath, Bring Me the Horizon. I don't care what it is that you're into. You'll be able to find something for yourself or your friends or your family. And above all, you can use this promo code 100 words or less that gets you 10% off of your entire order. And that's important because not only are you saving money, but then you signify that marketing works and that this show has a devoted audience. You know, all of those things. It's a virtuous cycle that happens here. But Rockabilia ships from the Midwest here in the United States of America, has over half a million items, friendly customer service, punk and hardcore kids work there, ticks all the boxes as far as I'm concerned. So Rockabilia is a place that you should support and go to their website and use the promo code 100 words or less rockabilia.com have fun shopping for all of the merch hey everybody i'm ben natafafri and i want to tell you about a show called the last archive it's about the history of truth in 20th century america each episode we tell a story about how people came up with new ways of knowing things and doubting things over the last 100 years histories of science technology democracy and also some pretty far out characters. What 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 the heck was that in? Well, it's Dr. Frankenstein's monster, isn't it? This season on the Last Archive, you'll hear stories about the dawn of social network theory. Of course I go, oh my god. Mid-century songwriting machines. I- I'm not an industrial spy, I'm a graduate student. Invasive species. They're chanting all together, bring back the nest. Bring <laughs> back the nest. All this and more on the new season of The Last Archive. Listen to The Last Archive on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. When you're talking about that obsessive nature, like I I really, I think it's something that most people, especially too, like has subculture has become, you know, so mainstream, like they're, you know, whatever, picking on the misfits where it's like, you know, people are wearing their shirts and clearly have no clue like who the misfits are, (laughs) like just, and understanding the levels of where it's like, I'm not talking about one, two, three layers deep. You're like, I care about the most irrelevant, stupid information (laughs) that is serving no purpose besides just like scratching that weirdo itch in my brain that I can't even explain to anybody who hasn't become obsessed with something. Exactly. Exactly. And and what, I guess, set you on that path? Like, you know, I'm guessing that, you know, because you didn't have like an older sibling and then clearly it didn't sound like you had that much of a, you know, I mean, maybe you had a musical family, but, you know, it wasn't like your dad was handing you Bad Brains records or something like that. What, um, what was the introduction point? Just kind of like existing around, you know, different people at school and stuff like that? No, not, not even that was, that was never it. It, okay. it, it literally just the, the first time that, I, I started, uh, you know, hearing music as a child, it just felt right. It just, it just filled something in me that I didn't, I wasn't able to fill in any other way. And, um, I remember being very young, like six, seven, and accidentally stumbling upon MTV one day on our, on our TV in our home in Virginia. And, uh, it just, 
that moment changed my life. And I just never felt, I never watched another channel again. Like that was it. And I had to like, I wasn't really allowed to watch it. So I had to like sort of sneak to watch it when I could. And it didn't matter what the video was or what the band was or what the song was at first. It was just a, a world that I knew I wanted a part of. And it felt more, um, I felt more at home in right. this sort of fantastical musical world than my reality. And I was very young when I made that connection and it just, that was it. Yeah. And when you, when you say you weren't allowed, was this uh, like a religious overtone or did your parents just like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, not what Wesley not would go down. Not religious, just more uh, traditional like conservative, you know? Got it. Yeah. yeah. This was show, showing him way too much. <laughs> yeah. It was like, you know, it was like, Girls, 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 you know, or you know it's like <laughs> totally like my kid, my child, my eight year old cannot watch this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's true. Especially when it's like you start to maybe ask questions that are, you know, inappropriate at a dinner table where it's like, you know, what is cherry pie? Like, I know it's a dessert, mom, but like, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think sketchier is I never asked a question. So I think it was just like, <laughs> you know. Right. Totally. Yeah. You're dropping it on random people at school and they're just like, what is he talking about? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, you know, and I think of hearing this different sort of music and, and then seeing um, older people who were like, you know, dressing the part and, and living it. I think it just, um, it just felt beautiful to me that, the, that there were different ways you could go, you know, in, in life. And, um, I just, I knew that was a way I was going to go. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, you, I mean, once you became obsessed with music, that was the only path. And uh, you, you said you put on shows, like, you know, were you uh, obviously just, you know, bringing whatever local punk and hardcore bands to, um, you know, have a spot there? Like what, what was your most uh, quote unquote successful show that you threw yourself? Um, probably the most um, successful show I did. I booked a show. I was in high school still, and it was Converge and Overcast and Disembodied at a. Oh, um, oh at yeah. A, yeah, I remember so, that tour. <laughs> <clears throat> exactly. So I did a show in New Hampshire for that, um, and then um, I did a. Uh, you know, I, I would I would call, I would call the the, the numbers in, inside seven inches and demo tapes and. Uh huh invite bands to come play and every now and then they took it up they took me up on it like i remember it was new year's eve i'm guessing 90 1998 maybe 99 but like i did a show for in kindle the in kindles oh and, yeah um in my friend's uh attic above his garage in this small town in maine that like you know maybe like 120 people showed up to and you know, I think it, it was a great show, but it was like in the middle of nowhere and I couldn't believe the band showed up, you know. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. I, I love those. I mean, the reason I got specific about that is because I just love those moments of where you feel so excited that you were able to pull this off. And then, you know, everybody, whatever, a kid showed up, band showed up, like it just feels like it's such a moment that you can't, it becomes difficult to describe how cool that is. It's the coolest. And like, you know, bless these people for like driving to these unknown su suburbs in the middle of nowhere and, and, and playing, you know, right. it, it changes lives. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm guessing that like, you know, as you became more, you know, enmeshed and putting on shows and, you know, caring even more about, you know, punk and hardcore and that subculture, uh, were you, um, I'm going to guess that like you weren't immediately taken by the idea of playing in a band or was that, you know, once you started to witness that you were very excited about trying to put something together. Um, no, I, I had, I just wanted it all. So like, right when I, right when I had sort of stepped back the peripheral step past the peripheral edges of, of punk, which, which is just, you know, buying like classic first albums, you know, and, and, and finding out that, like for, for me, for me, you know, the, the, the trajectory was you, you, you get like the classic records first, and then you find out that it's, you're coexisting in a timeline where it's happening around you. And then it's a matter of just finding out what that is. And it doesn't matter if the bands are good or bad, just that they exist is enough. And, um, once you find that out, 
you're exposed to this whole world world of like local bands and zines and shows. And to me, for me, it was just a matter of, I wanted it all. I didn't, I didn't want to just do one of them or um, I just wanted as much as I could partake in. So I did do bands right away. And this, this is, uh, or, or attempted to rather, I guess, you know, um, someone wrote to me recently, actually, actually, and said they have a video of me, I'm probably 13 in it and I'm singing. Um, it's on a military base in Stuttgart, Germany, and I'm singing like Misfits and Sex Pistols covers with like my ninth grade fellow students who knew about that music. And so I, I had tried to do a, a band as early as ninth grade. And then uh, that continued again in the 10th grade. I probably played like one to two shows of, of, of cover songs. And then I moved to Maine, 11th grade. I was asked to sing in like a few like bands that did nothing. Tried, they, they, were, they were no good, but I was like on the path to doing it, but I hadn't, it just wasn't there yet. And right. then um, shortly after that, I mean, I, I, I was had graduated high school for like maybe a year and a half when American Nightmare started. So Got it. It was, I was just sort of waiting uh, until the right thing appeared and, and that was it. And that's when I, uh, I guess opened up. You know? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. When you, when you were able to, you know, have something that was a, a little more serious than what you had previously experienced. Yeah. And I think like when the, uh, you, you hear the music that coerces you into opening up, you know, and that hadn't happened before that, you know? Right. I, I, really like how you put, I mean, it's true because like, especially too, like what you're talking about where your first band experiences are, you know, you're just operating off of pure, like, okay, I want to rip off like these three bands or whatever. And like, you're just like, you're operating off of pure instinct in a, not a bad way, but in a very calculated way. Whereas like when you do get surrounded by people who all of a sudden unlock whatever it is like that you're doing together, that's when it's like, oh my gosh, like this is what I've tried to arrive at. That's exactly right. And, and the, that that's magic that that can happen, you know, cause you, you don't know that you have that inside of you. I didn't, I had this like, you know, I don't know, l less than 20 years of life experience at the time, but it, 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 it was my experience. And, but I was, I didn't know that that's what I would articulate once given music that sort of brought that out of me, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's beautiful. The, um, I know that you, I mean, you've expressed this not only lyrically, but, you know, spoken about in interviews, that your you know, inability to, you know, air quote, get comfortable in whatever station you're at in life. And it seems like that, especially towards the end of American Nightmare, where it was just like the, you know, level of comfort that you had was like non-existent. And you're like, I got to get out of here. Um, I, I'm guessing that that was something that, you know, you obviously just had to do based on like, I can't, I'm not going to be around if I still continue to, you know, behave the way that I am and like the mental state that I'm in. Yeah. It was very unhealthy at that point because, um, for, for several reasons, we had just run ourselves into the ground with like extensive touring. You know, it was, we were pretty much a nonstop band making no money, but touring all the time. So it, you know, I just the, the physical toll that that would take on you was pretty brutal, even in my early twenties. Um, and then uh, on top of that, I was just like having, I was just like not uncomfortable. I was drinking at the time. And like, I, I had to do that to even cope because I was so unhappy at that point. Then you have the pressure of not wanting to let down the people who have invested time in into this project with you. And then on top of that, uh, you know, as bands grow, there's different things and, 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 and moves that people want to make or encourage you to make that aren't really totally in line with your initial core interest of why you want to play music in the first place. So we had sort of grown this band to this level where it was sort of, we were like, okay, you can either just stay doing the same thing, repeating yourself or you try to grow, which seems like a natural thing to do, but that growth means taking steps into worlds where you don't really want to be. So American nightmare was pretty popular at the time for like, you know, a, a hardcore band that was mm -hmm. playing pretty 
relatively traditional hardcore, but like we still weren't like a warp tour type band or like a, a, like a, like more melodic punk band. And I think those would have been like the logical next steps a band would want to take, but that's just not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to really pursue those uh, avenues and, and, and my taste in music had, had surpassed what I was playing and I just wanted to try different things, you know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, especially when you, uh, that dovetails nice into another question I was going to ask in regards to, um, you know, not only American Nightmare, but clearly a lot of other things that you have done since with, you know, Cold Cave, Heartworm Press, where the business implications, like, and I, you know, that's just something as simple as, you know, getting, <laughs> putting on a show and paying, you know, converge $200 for playing a basement or whatever. Exactly. So like, did you, it sounds like you were relatively comfortable with that aspect of it, like understanding that there are, you know, I mean, even if it's small stakes, like financial implications in the business side of things, did you, I guess, like those aspects of, you know, American Nightmare? And then as you were, you know, growing in other different areas? What the, what, sorry, what do you mean? Like, did, did I like, or was I comfortable in understanding of the financial aspect of it? Is exactly. That what you mean? Yeah. Did you like the business side of the, you know, the music and obviously everything you've done since? No, and, and not at all, actually. Okay. And, 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 um, I think my whole approach to that has been like, ha, has like strangely worked in my favor, but my, my whole thing was just never considering it and never thinking about it. And like, this is, I just jumped into everything I, I did and have done to this day without considering the financial aspects or, or ramifications or debt incurred by anything I've ever chosen to do. I was just, if, if it's something I wanted to do, I just figured out how to do it. it, it and, that, and it was that simple. And, um, you know, from which often meant a loss right. <laughs> financially, sure. but I, but, but to me, it wasn't a matter of like, I, I never saw the, the worth as just like a, on a scale of money. It was like, I'm going to lose money doing this, but it's going to be such a monumental moment for me. And it's something I care so passionately about that the worth like just is, is triple the loss. So, and I sort of lived my life that way, you know, like uh, even to this day that like I'm putting out these books that I think are so important and they're books that I want to own, but they don't make money often. And some do and some don't, but it's not really the point that I think the, the worth of this book existing is worth more than like the, the money that it costs to, make it exist even for tours like you know if, if if a band that we love asks us to go support them it may not pay what we, we would make on our own but it's just something that we want to do because we find it important to do for like the legacy of this band or like in the in the in the lineage of, of music and what's maybe saved us in the past personally that we're going to give back to this artist whether or not it, it, it cripples you momentarily. And, and, and I think that's been such a benefit to me and to everything I've been a part of because um, I've never let money be a deciding factor in, in what we do, you know? And, and, and I think like, you know, I, I was speaking about this recently, but my, my very first American nightmare show that ever happened I booked the show and I, I went and found um, a church that would let me book the show in it in, in Portland, Maine. And they told me how much it would be. And it was like, you know, I think it was $400 for the room. And then I had to rent a PA for like 200 bucks. And you know, when you're, when you're 20 years old, like 600 bucks is a lot of money. And like, definitely that money didn't come through the door that night, but I s somehow hustled enough money to pay those bills. And it, it, it didn't matter that I lost money on the show. I'm in a band now and I just played a show and it was fucking sick and, right. I'm, and I'm good. Like, and I've lived my life like that, you know, you know them and you love them. And if you don't know them, I am making you aware of them. And that is evil net. They are an amazing web store solution for bands, record labels, all to ship stuff out to you, the consumer. I know that may be slightly confusing, but follow along here. You order stuff, they send you stuff. And, they act like a record label because they have a very curated list of bands and labels that they work with. But before I let you know about the, that list of bands and labels, you need to use this promo code. So you type in evilgreed.net, you type in 100 words at checkout, and you will get 10% off of your entire order, which is a deal. 
I mean, let's be honest. You're spending hundred bucks. I give you ten dollars. That's basically like me taking you out for, you know, lunch. Like, you know, how about a asahi bowl or something like that? Anyways, Evil Greed is based in Berlin, Germany, and they work with labels like Triple B, Flat Spot, Sergeant House, Maggot Stomp. So many cool things. Basically, if it operates under the banner of what I would define as sort of like artistic heavy stuff, (laughs) that is what they do. And they work with bands like Power Trip and Nails and so many cool things. Trust me in saying you will get lost on their website in the best way possible. And they ship it to you very fast. In Berlin, Germany, the shipping rates are very advantageous for us here in the United States. It does not cost an arm and a leg to get something to you. So if you want to buy the latest vinyl long sleeves, hoodies, whatever it is, order it from evilgreed.net and you will be highly satisfied. And again, use the promo code 100 words. Thank you for your continued support, Evil Greed. Hey everybody, I'm Ben Natafafri and I want to tell you about a show called The Last Archive. It's about the history of truth in 20th century America. Each episode, we tell a story about how people came up with new ways of knowing things and doubting things over the last hundred years. Histories of science, technology, democracy, and also some pretty far out characters. What? What? What the heck was that? In? Well, it's Dr. Frankenstein's monster, isn't it? This season on the Last Archive, you'll hear stories about the dawn of social network theory. Of course, I go. Oh my god! Mid-century songwriting machines. I'm not an industrial spy. I'm a graduate student. Invasive species. Just chanting all together. Bring back the nest. Bring (laughs) back the nest. All this and more on the new season of The Last Archive. Listen to The Last Archive on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. You open up your aperture enough to, like, execute the idea, and then afterwards you can you know, pick up the pieces if there are pieces left and then be able to be like, okay, like I I can do that again versus like, oh, I can do that again, except, you know, maybe I just do it a little differently this way. Yeah. And and, and that's the worth in in everything. You know, it's, that's always been first, you know? Yeah. No, I like, I mean that that's realistically like, you know, how art and commerce, you know, in most people's opinions should collide where it's like this, the art is dictating the commerce as opposed to vice versa. Exactly. Exactly. And so it it also seems to me like your interest in literature, you know, speaking about heartworm and obviously all of the, um, you know, lyrical content that you, you have pulled from in the past has been something that's been long running, or was that something that, you know, kind of started to jump in your life in your, you know, late teens, early twenties, as far as, you know, just your love for reading and the consumption of that stuff. I think it was just parallel to music. It was just another world that, um, that just made sense to me. Um, the, the lyrical aspect of music <clears throat> was, was more important to me than music, than the, than the sound of music. Um, of, of course that combination it, it is what made it so appealing, but it, it, it was, it was people singing things that I felt that I wasn't able to articulate that changed my life. And, um, that, tr- that crossed over into poetry that spoke to me. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's 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 all just been sort of um under the same umbrella to me and it's it's just what i care about and i want to give back to and um i don't know I, I just don't see that much of a difference between them i you know especially um when sort of digging through the past with like old older poetry of like deceased people you know there there there, there, there weren't these like worlds of, of music to help them get their ideas across and maybe these people would have been musicians who knows but um there there really is no difference between what they were trying to put out into the world and express as opposed to like you know some of my favorite lyricists now you know yeah no it's a good point it's like the the vehicle may not have existed and so it's like exactly right so this is how they're going to express themselves yeah they're once your life shifted out to LA and obviously, especially with, you know, your expression of music via cold cave, um, it seems to me like you can, you can conduct your creative pursuits and like the business aspect at a more, you know, comfortable clip where like, you know, with American nightmare where you're like, Oh yeah, you know, we're touring 200 to 250 days out of the year and that sort of stuff. Um, 
how did you, I guess, learn how to, you know, take that shift of being like, okay, that what I was doing with American Nightmare wasn't sustainable. Um, was that a long process for you to kind of understand how to apply that towards your future endeavors? <sighs> yeah, I mean, it's complicated because, um, you know, I, like Whole Cave exists in a more traditional music industry world. Sure. Um, so if you, if you were to operate this band in the way that like American nightmare did it touring all the time, it, it, it would, it would just destroy it. So you have to, you sort of have to like nurture it, baby it and understand that it's, it, it's, it's worth isn't just in, um, you know, playing that many shows a year. It, it's, it's more like making special choices that are going to be rewarding to you and to the people who are coming to see it. You know, there's, there's, um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, I, I guess I still struggle with it too, because when I'm home for too long, I, I do get antsy and, and, and I am so used to being on the move that it's off. It's sometimes it's difficult for me to, um, just if I don't have like a tour booked, it's stressful to me, you know, but, but, um, I do things to sort of align my schedule into the future. Um, like for, for example, I, Cole Cave just got a tour with Depeche Mode. And before that tour happened, I knew that if I come right off that tour, I'm going to be in such a depressed state from how elated my, that experience was going to be that I can't just come home and sit still and do nothing. So I booked American nightmare shows to offset like that depression. Cause I was like that I'm going to need that experience to, to center myself. Other, otherwise I'm just going to be sitting home all summer depressed. I can't, I can't do that. Somehow we're making it work and somehow we're making it work whilst in that world, while still subscribing to the ethos that first spoke to me, you know, I, I have worked with labels of, of very of um, various degrees, but for the past like decade or so, I have been releasing my own music, and it's been really beneficial because we're given these or we're, we're we we do sometimes get these like incredible opportunities, and they're and they're only based on our own merit. Like we don't have a manager or a booking agent or a label pitching us for these opportunities. Now it's literally like Depeche Mode or Nine Inch Nails or, or someone in the stature being like, Hey, Hey you, I, I want you to be on the store. And, and that's it. And that's beautiful. That that's able to happen from a place of um, our own hustle, which we've learned from being young punks, you know? No, oh, absolutely. And I, I think that's, you know, not only does that come through in the decisions that you make, the tours you make, and, you know, all of that is all rooted back to the fact that, like you said, there's that connectivity with the DIY nature of it, where it's like almost irregardless of the style of music that you're playing, you can apply the same principles, broadly speaking, over art in general. Exactly. And you can. And I think um, <clears throat> um, it, it comes with some sacrifices, but all of which have been worth it for me personally. I just, um, there have, there've been times where I've, I've tried to step into a mold and, and, and of a, of a more traditional route against my better judgment. And it just, it's not a place I can exist in, you know? So, um, I don't, I don't heed well to, um, other people's expectations and, and I'm not that great of a team player. So I kind of have to exist in this way just to keep existing. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, the, you know, does not pull up, play well with others. It's like, mm -mm. well, it, that's like something I've learned about myself and like, I'm not going to bum anybody else out by doing this. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, mm. and with that idea of, you know, like you mentioned some of the touring opportunities, like, you know, cold cave is definitely, you've been thrown in situations that, for one, you've either never been in before or, you know, might not ever experience again. Um, which kind of either tours or sets of shows that, you know, you have had the opportunity to, you know, dive into with Cold Cave have been the ones that have made you feel the most, um, you know, sort of fish out of water scenario? Gosh, you know, I have to say, I don't actually feel like a fish out of water. Um, 
That's fine. I, I, I do feel like everything has been manifested. Sure. And um, it's just an extension of the of of love that me or Amy have given to to this band and to the music that we love. So, um, when we found ourselves on tours with with like the Jesus and Mary chain or, or ministry or nine channels or Depeche mode, it just feels actually kind of natural to us because um, it's like, of, of, of course that's what is going to happen because that's what we care about, you know? And, right. and, and when we've been so open to the world and, and, it, and it came back to us. And so um, yeah, like these are, aren't situations that we experience in our own world on our own tours, but um I, we feel totally comfortable stepping in there and and performing on 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 stages like that or to crowds of, of that magnitude. It it doesn't really shake us. Um and um I don't know. I just feel like this is what what we do and it doesn't matter if there's a hundred people or like a hundred thousand people. It's just we're we're doing what we do regardless, you know. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And uh, kind of on that same tip as well, where when you know, AN first started to do the, you know, reunion shows, um, you know, many, many years ago. And, you know, so you start to have the fire to, you know, put out more music. And I think there really has been a deliberate nature to what you guys are doing, where it's not just this, um, you know, old man, hardcore tour nostalgia act, because, you know, clearly you're putting out new music and there's vitality still involved with it. Um, I'm going to guess that there was, you know, especially once you started to come back, there was that temptation of being like, oh yeah, we can just like kind of do this now. And like, we don't even need to really think about all these other, you know, expressions. But, uh, you know, I know that that w- it wasn't the path you went down, but I'm sure that there was a, you know, slight temptation to kind of do that maybe. What, what do you mean? Just to like, yeah, just basically be like, okay, like, you know, yeah, we can whatever do the, you know, quote unquote cash grab of, you know, hardcore festivals and all that sort of stuff. But right. Tarnish the legacy of the band or whatever. Yeah. I mean, um, I think I, I never felt that. So I, I felt that, um, it was something to be precious with and, um, you, you know, it, it only, it only could serve, uh, it only could serve anyone if, if it was done in, um, from a place of love. And, um, you know, we, we were asked to do things that we said no to. Like when AN got back together, we were asked to play Coachella. We said, no, it was not something that we wanted to experience. and wasn't something that I wanted to do with this band. And um, I had already played that festival at this point. And I was like, this isn't a good idea. This isn't going to be fun. It's not what this band is about. I don't want to do this. But then like, you know, if a more like sort of, punk esque uh fast asks us to play we, we would consider it and um you know um i think um when we first got back together not everyone was on the same page so so th- there wasn't a, a real plan to um for us to come together as a unit and try to collect on it really fast you know we 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 really weren't like a cohesive thing un- until a few years after our reunion so to speak mm-hmm. so um and by the point by the time where we started making new music we everyone who was in the band at that point was on the same page and we we did want to be careful about it and we did want to play music that spoke to who we were now as opposed to just music that we made when we were younger or something yeah and um and i think like the the, the new record that we made is is probably you know and it, 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 for me, I like it the most of almost anything we've ever done aside from like the first two seven inches that we, you know, those, that would be my favorite material that we've done. You know, there's songs on um, every record that I feel a connection with, but there is a um, immediacy to these new songs and how, and how they were written and how they were recorded and how they came together. So natural that I, I'm just really proud of it. And, and I, I I'm, I'm, I can't, it's like part of me is surprised that it, it sounds the way it does. And there's so much life in it because I, it's like, like you said, like on, on paper, it's like, it's just an old man band making um, like music that's referential to what their idea of hardcore may have been 20 years ago or something. And it doesn't feel that way to me at all. It, it feels very natural. And, and, and um, 
you, with, with, like when I'm making music for Cold Cave, I labor over um, the lyrical content of it. It, it. it doesn't always come so quick or to me, but like when I'm making um, American Nightmare music and my role is like so clear cut and understood that I just need to sing on these fucking songs that it sort of just like falls out of out of thin air and it exists and then i'm pleasantly surprised that i'm able to conjure that still and that i have something to say yeah and and and, and in that and in that way you know because I, I i when i first stopped doing this band i would or, and stopped doing like some girls and bands like that i i i, I thought i was at this point in my life where i just didn't want to like i didn't want to like be loud you know i didn't want to like scream anymore and i thought like it meant like maybe like screaming means you're mentally ill and I don't want to be mentally ill anymore. I don't want to be like, like I don't see a difference between like standing on a stage and screaming and like that person sitting on a corner screaming, you know, I didn't want to subscribe to that, but I've found um, a comfortable way of, or a way that's comfortable to me anyway, to, to, to let that out. And um, I, I feel a healthy way, you know? Yeah. Oh, for sure. No. Well, that, and I just like that idea of being like, being able to put yourself into something where it's like my, like you said, my role is so clearly defined. I can exist in this space and I feel comfortable existing in this space. And it's easy for me to do this because I know my role to play. Yeah. So there's that. And then there's the, um, the, the major factor of it is, is what happens like inside these rooms during, during shows and that it is, um, that there are these different people from different walks of life and that they're all there for different, but probably similar reasons of um, varying definition and that people are able to get something out of this sound and, 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 and this emotion that makes um, this band existing like 100% worth it. And, and, and if that weren't, um, such a major aspect of the band, like the live situation, it, it definitely wouldn't exist. And we definitely wouldn't play shows. And, and, and that's why, you know, in the past we've been like, okay, that's not the show for us to play, or that's not the fest for us to play because we're not going to get that experience out of it. It's not going to be um, a, a communal experience. And, um, you know, yeah, there's no re- there's no reason for you to do this if you didn't actually want to do this because yeah, the, <laughs> the band uh, ostensibly doesn't need to do what it does unless there is a real reason behind it at this point. Exactly, and it's like you know it it's it's not um like this band is not like anyone's like career or or, or job. It's it's not why like everyone involved is. Uh, totally fine doing like not doing it, you know, like if we didn't get that out of it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. The last two things I want to hit on was the idea of heartworm press and, you know, realistically, I mean, I definitely compare what you're doing to, uh, you know, something like feral house where it's just like you guys are, you know, the publishing houses are focused on, you know, subculture art, uh, the idea of outsiders, whether it's poetry or whether it's just the subject matter that they're covering. Um, but I, I'm going to guess that a lot of the uh, operating principles of what you were doing when you first started to publish either your own work through Heartworm or then obviously, uh, you know, open that up to other people. <laughs> did, did it feel like basically kind of starting a band in a way as far as like, okay, well, I got to figure out who to print this stuff through and that sort of stuff. Or did it, was this as an entirely uh, kind of new endeavor that you were when you first started? Um, I mean, it, it, I guess it was similar to the steps you would take when you're putting out. Yeah. If you were in a new band and you wanted to go make a demo tape or, or, you know, you, first you would just go to like Kinko's or Staples or something and steal a bunch of paper and photocopy it for free and walk out and not pay a dime. You know, it was like, that's how like the zine started. Um, and then, uh, w- when it moved more into like book world, um, I had people who I work with to this day who are from punk and hardcore who were able to be like, Oh, this is like the printer you should use. And the first printer I use th- that I made deathbeds with 
is the printer I use to this day. So there wasn't much exploration I had to do post that. And um, these people are really hands-on and they're wonderful printers. And um, I, I got lucky that I knew someone who knew this printer. And um, th there, there's, there's um, I don't know. It's like, there's a, there's a lot more that <clears throat> if I only had to concentrate on this press, there's a lot more that could be done in terms of like, like marketing and, 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 and finding more stores to carry it. But at the same time, I, I, I like that people who it's meant for tend to find it. And, um, I think our, our, our music is kind of like that. Like you mentioned, like, I'm not good at plugging myself or like selling myself. We just kind of stay at the course and do what we do. And, um, luckily it resonates with people and they tend to come find us and that's just a more comfortable place for us to exist in whether it's cold cave or american nightmare or uh putting out books by people we admire um you know it, it is all an extension of your first steps into um like the world of diy you know and the fact that um it sort of bloomed into this whole thing is just a test testament to, um, I, I think our, our deep care of it all, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the last thing is, you know, being a father and watching the world through someone else's eyes, uh, that, you know, I mean, I know it sounds like a cliche, but it clearly changes people. Um, how does that make you reflect on like, you know, either your upbringing or the fact that, you know, at some point your kid is going to look at, you know, whether it's your books, your music or whatever, and be like, yo, dad, that sucks. Like, you know, like he, the, the <laughs> rebellion nature is going to exist in some capacity. Um, is that something that you've either, you know, put any uh, mental thought towards, or is it basically just like, well, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. No, I mean, my whole life, people have told me I suck at everything I do. So I, I'm not going to like <laughs> ch change that no matter what. So right. uh, it doesn't really have that much of an impact on it. I mean, <clears throat> there's things, I mean, I think like m my relation to that is more like, um, I guess I, I, I feel like an early sense of, um, not regret, but, um, like, I don't want my child to ever feel as terrible in life as I've felt. And I'm, and it's difficult for me that I've recorded, uh, that sensation and that they're going to have to understand that and, or, or, or choose not to, which is fine too, but it is all there. And like, I think if anything, uh, a goal of mine now would be to stay alive, to kind of say that just to stay alive as an example that these are real emotions that people can have and they can overcome them. You know? mm -hmm. Right. It's like the, the idea that even though my, you know, trauma, grief, everything has been kind of, you know, spilled out via art. Like I'm still standing and I'm still, you know, present uh, as I can be for, you know, you and all the people that I care about. Yeah, and that the beauty of it is that it has helped people, and that's all that really matters. And that is that. Wes, really appreciate you coming on the show, and to his publicist of the stars, Stephanie Marlowe, who is a previous guest of the show. Shout out to her, because she always brings the heat, brings the good ideas to me to be like, hey, we should do this. I'm like, you know what? Yes, we should. Next week is, this is a little bit left of center conversation, but uh, follow along here. You'll understand me. This is Christina Ward, who is the, I guess, CEO, I don't know what her actual title is, head honcho, <laughs> of Feral House Publishing. And I felt like this was a nice dovetail to the conversation that we had with Wes here, because Wes has published a ton of books, uh, you know, works under the moniker Heartworm Press. And Feral Ward, I know it came into my orbit just noticing that they publish a lot of books on sort of, you know, deviant art, a lot of things in relation to just the the subcultures, as it were. And so uh, Christina, I always found to be an interesting individual. She's published a lot of books and she pursues uh, a lot of people who are interesting voices that should have 
a book inside of them. And she works with them to pull it out. And yeah, anyways, they publish like Lords of Chaos, the, you know, done a variety of different topics on, um, you know, Satanism. They've published some of Eugene Robinson from Oxbow's stuff. It's just, yeah, it's a really, really good independent publishing house that has its roots within punk and hardcore and all the subcultures that we love. So anyways, that is what's up. That's who we have next week. Christina Ward from Feral House Publishing. And until then, please be safe, everybody. It's the Marketer's Report. Today, Capital One's Chief Brand Officer, Mark Mentry, weighs in on building loyalty with customers. Capital One has really worked to create amazing access moments for our customers. Anywhere from when we have a live event, there will be customer events ahead of that. We will do sound check parties so that only Capital One cardholders can get access to, and we can't pull that off without the relationship iHeart has with the artists, with venues to create these really exclusive events, festivals that iHeart puts on, gives Capital One the ability to, to create those moments. People are passionate about their favorite artists, and so we try to tap into that together. As the number one audio company, iHeart Media gives marketers access to all. Every audience, live conversations, trusted influencers, and the insights and data you need to grow. Not just a media company. iHeart Media is your access company. If you're a marketer, go to iHeartResults.com. Deep in the mountains of Greece, the country's most wanted man has been on the run for over a decade. He's a bank robber. We hear a barrage of shots. A kidnapper. But to many Greeks, he's a hero. His name is Vasilis Paliokostas, and we're on the trail of the man behind the myth. A modern-day Robin Hood who steals from the rich and gives to the poor. I'm Miles Gray. Listen to The Good Thief on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.